Uh, tell a story that, about when that was in Tennessee, was it? Yeah, yeah. That was way back whenever I was a young man. Oh, uh, and the country, the whole country is supposed to be dry on probation, you know. Yeah. And there's an old fella lived up uh, on the other side, right above Chattanooga, Tennessee, up towards Cleveland, a little piece. The old fella, he had him a steel up there, and he he making moonshine whiskey. Well, I went up there one Af one afternoon and uh, wanted to get me a little bit of drams to sort of nip on a little, you know, and so I carried my banjo along this to as I as they was, uh, they was awful about banjo picking. The whole family had several children, had one girl, his girl, she was about 22 year old, I guess, mm -hmm. and they was all crazy about picking banjo, and I hadn't been that long, but I didn't get there that long. We'll say in the shank of the afternoon, you know. I didn't buy my, I was by myself and ejected the old fella come in, he had him a jug, you know. So we ain't nothing to do, he said I had to stay and eat supper with him. Well you, you gotta stay all night. I said, No, I can't stay all night, but I'll eat supper with you. So one we kept nipping along on that, you know, and we didn't want it to sour all at once, you know, we wanna get some of it. So we eat supper and we it's cold weather and we was sitting around the fireplace he lived down in the country you know and everybody just had a wood fire sitting there you know and i got to picking the old the old banjo and so they like to hear me pick that piece they called it the girl called it lonesome ruby and you know, her dad called it the train piece and i was picking an old banjo you know and it had a had a cast in head on it and i'd i'd warmed it up and got it pretty tight you know the head where it saw the sound, and I had a little bitty low bridge on it, and you could, in the bridge it slide backwards and forward, and it creaks whenever you're pulling it hard, you know. And I had had enough of that moonshine to just make me want to pick anyhow. And I got to picking that, you know, and I was pulling them trains, and you could hear that bridge <laughs> click, click, <laughs> click, and direct to the girl, points at that and said, "Listen, Papa," said, "You can hear the rail to click it." <laughs> 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 yeah. That's a really old one now. <laughs> how, how, what did, when you There's a whole lot more to it that I forgot. When your brother-in-law popped the head of his banjo, how'd he get a 
another one fixed up for it. Oh, he done cut that old now. Oh, he cut it off? Oh. He, he'd kill a cat. If, he, if there's anybody in the country, in the, in the neighbors had a big old tom cat, you know, the big old cat to get away up by catching them. If he'd get a hold of that cat, he'd kill it. He'd, he'd, uh, he'd cut his head off. <coughs> he'd skin that cat and cut his head off and split his head open and get the brain and go to rubbing on the flesh side. And in a little while, he'd have the hair off. In a few hours, he'd have it on the banjo and picking on it. Mm -hmm. Of course, he'd put it on there, you know, and then he'd hold it up in front of the fire, you know, and dry it. Does so that make a good uh, makes a good head, head uh, cat? Yeah. Of course, it ain't nothing like as good as this. This year is supposed to be waterproof, you know, yeah. this head. Yeah. yeah, it can sound just as good in rainy weather as in fair weather. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what do you think about old-time banjo picking? you think it's coming back? Well, yeah. not, 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 not the old-timey like I pick. Oh, everybody, all, all these younger people uh, pick it scrub style, pick, mm -hmm. with, pick on two fingers and their thumb. I can't pick that way, mm -hmm. you see. Yeah. But you think some people are still interested in hearing this old time music? Well, they seem to be, yes. They, uh, they, uh, everywhere I go, you see, even if these good banjo pickers, see, I don't profess to be no no professional banjo picker. I'm just an old uh, hillbilly banjo thump owner. I don't <laughs> I just, but everywhere I go, just about it. If, if anybody there knows me, well, they want me to pick that shout ruler. And these, and I've never seen it yet. I've got my first fellow yet that picked scrub style that could that pick shout ruler. They never, they don't pick it. They never heard of it. Well, they, 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 it's interesting to them. They never heard anything like that. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. Thank, thank you, Guy. Th 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 thank you for uh, telling me to come in here. I was, just, I was just thinking about you the other night, and I said to myself, now, if I don't call me right away, but that damn thing go call him. Mm -hmm. uh, you was lucky to find me at home. See, I'm just at home when I ain't gone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, okay, well. Uh,
Got another song I made up, you know. I've always been down and out, never could get nowhere, you know. And I started making a little head with my painting. I got to sing a song about Don't Try to Hold Me Down, I'm a Rising Up. There's this title of it, I'm Rising Up. Let's do a little of that. I got a little old song uh, that I sang uh, in Washington. They titled the show after this song, and it's, uh, in the verse it says something about I got more than this old world can pay. And uh, I'm not too good in tune at all. I'll try a little verse then. Y'all just tell me now you don't change back. Well, this is a little in Europe uh, that Art likes. I'll play it. <laughs> When did you sing that? When did you learn that song? Tell us about those parties. Oh, uh, that's back when I was a parties. kid. We had uh, Saturday night dances. We called them home dances. They parties. We'd have dances and box suppers for young people and all of this, making up money to buy a church or making up money to paint a church or anything. They'd have a box supper. And the pretty girls around over the community would fix up boxes, you know, put bananas and sandwiches and all kinds, some of them big cakes and things, and they'd have an auctioneer, you know. And they'd auction these boxes off, and the fellow that bought this girl's box, well, he'd get to eat with her. And 
So some pretty girl is pretty, you know, popular in the community. They'd run her doggone box way up high, and nobody couldn't hardly buy it. Somebody get to put up money for this to buy her away from her own sweetheart, you know, to eat with. <laughs> and so we played these songs, and then we danced, and they lined up, and they and they swinging partners, and that's a kind of a a theme to a little old, uh, party swinging song, you know. I sang a little verse of that and uh, sung up at Smithsonian. Yeah. I could pick that one with you. I bet you're pretty. Yeah, five from five. Yeah. All right, get ready to tune up when we we'll try it in a minute. I'll play this one while you're getting ready. Yeah, get, get yours and tune up and we'll, I'll play it again, Duck, and see if we can get together. We need to get together and practice a little bit. Well, yeah, well, we got our game together. Why couldn't you get with us? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let me sing this other little one right well, here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this one here is one that I made up, and uh, I do wild tapes, you know. Uh, people send empty tapes in. I say, Howard, how about filling this tape? Well, when I'm out on uh, trips, you know, I tell people that uh, if I ain't got time to make them a little tape, I say, well, if you send me empty tape sometime and have time, I'll fill it for you. So I play the banjo on the tape. And, Talk to him, you know, and everything, and send a tape to him. So this little tape got out, this little song on it, and up in the Smithsonian, they got a hold of this title of the song, and they said they liked it, and they wanted the title to show up there at Smithsonian with it, and they wrote, uh, sent me a contract, said, Howard, if you'll sign this contract, to let us use the title of your painting, so we want to use it for the show, your song. I said, okay, so I signed it, so they used it for the title in this song. But in the course, I said, I got more than land or sky. Well, the title of the song is, I got more than so world can ever hold. See those college girls. Oh yeah. I was up in uh, I was up in Virginia and uh, I was out in Kemp's backyard. He was my agent that time. A lot of my paintings up there. I went to the Richmond Times and two more newspapers, a Gazette, two or three newspapers around there. And I went in and I I was out there one day and and I had a vision, you know, that I'd come back young again. I felt like a 16-year-old boy, and I thought I was in Virginia, you know, and I thought I was meeting lots of young people like we usually always do. And I made up a little song, a verse of it, if I could think of it now, and I sung it for them, and they loved it down there. I'll see if I can get a hold of that verse. that boy I had fun thinking that so and I saw that over a telephone to a newspaper and she just had a fit you know and and uh, she want, she liked that song you know and I could sing it by I could sing it in different places like I was down to the University of Georgia and stuff. just a thing in the round Georgia land
<laughs> you made that song up, Howard, but you, you used the tune of the Lone Prairie, didn't you? I don't know what the tune is. <laughs> do that, uh, Howard, would you do that, um, um, that old, uh, that old uh, camp meeting song, Some Have Mothers Over oh, Here yeah. Over uh, On The Other Shore? That's yeah. Some Have Mothers up as many verses to that it's so old it's not in the book anymore and it's somehow children over yonder somehow well, that, that sisters all that's in, in Thomas land you know yeah it uh, it went on some have a savior or some have friends over yonder and all that and you just sing it and sing it I like it. it's a good old song I don't have it listed no more yeah I made up one about God can do that for you I made up one about uh, well just any of them that I made up Anytime you want to play, just call them in, and then uh, uh, I'll play any of them that you want to play, but uh, I'm not uh, a struggling musician. I like to play, you know. I like to play. I enjoy it, I mean. Yeah. Well, I can't play like him and regular banjo pickers, you know. I sort of chord it out a little. Maybe while, while the tape's running, maybe tell us. Can you say a few words about your new church and about your garden here on the other? Oh, yeah, I'll be glad to. Uh, uh, this, uh, I've been working on close to 22 years on this garden. When I come here, it was actually it was just a wasted land that you had to have a boots on to cross it. It was mucky and full of turtles and snakes. I killed over 100 snakes just cleaning it up. Cut down trees out of there enough to build a house or two and couldn't get them out. Just had to let them rot up. They couldn't get in there with a tractor or nothing, you know, and... So finally I got to the park on the way. I felt like I had to build a garden. I wanted to build it on the church property where I was pastoring a church. I pastored nine churches, and I couldn't get them a notion of building a garden on the church property for the church and the people. And So I came home kind of disappointed and felt like I had to build a garden, so I, I took my backyard to build a garden in. So I started building a garden in my backyard, and then my wife started in on me. She didn't like a garden in her backyard. and. So we finally, uh, finally, I just told her, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll say, we'll measure off the middle of the house. I'll give you the front rooms and the front porch and all the front. I says, I'll take the back porch and the back room and the backyard. I said, you do what you want to at the front porch and the front part of the house. I'll do what I want to at the back porch and the back part of the house. And I said, if a man can't, uh, if a man can't exist on his back, own back porch, it's time for him to move on. So I got up agreement, you know, after we arbitrated and got into the regular meeting sessions and everything, and finally that was agreeable. 
And so I took over the backyard, and I told her, I said, I'll have more visitors in my backyard than you'll ever have on your front porch, lady. And we argued a little about that, you know. And that was fun, you know. All of it was fun to me, you know, to have to come into all of these different meetings, these different parties, like consulting the whole church and the body to try to get a place to build a garden. Then when you got home, you had to go in and ask the queen of the house about building a garden. And then you had to go through all this arbitration and everything, and finally you wind up with the backyard. All right, I wound up with the backyard, and I got it up this far and everything, and I fixed bicycles and a lawnmower. That's a good kind of a business, you know. A kid will come up with a 16-inch bicycle. He'll say, but y'all want a 16-inch bicycle for my kid. I don't want to buy a new one. I said, all right, I got one out there. painted up stripes, it's ready to go. Well, he gets that 16-inch bike, and a little kid learns to ride on it, and the next year he'll come back and say, how'd you know he's outgrowed that 16-inch bicycle? He needs a 20-inch now. I said, well, I got a 20-inch. I'll trade it, trade it back in. Uh, for somebody else, no, you're 20 inch. So I get a 20 inch, I'll let one same family, you know. And about a couple of years, I come back and say, Howard, we don't need a 20 inch no more, we need a 24 inch. And I say, Well, I got a 24 inch, so I'm all ready to go. <laughs> so I just, uh, and the next time they come, they want a 26. And I sell from a 16 inch to a 26 bicycle to the same family. And I had so many of them, I couldn't keep enough bicycles. And it's a very good business because when time gets hard, they buy more old stuff and they will new stuff. And lawnmower business is the same thing. If God hadn't called me into painting sacred art, I'd still have been fixing lawnmower and bicycles because it's the best business I know of right now. But you can make money at it right now. And so I started uh, one day over at the house. I never had told too many people interviewed me about this art, but. I walked out on that back porch over there where you seen a while ago where those gourds are hanging and the gate out there behind that Cadillac. I seen a man out there as 15 foot tall. His head was wide as a large refrigerator. He was the biggest man that I ever seen in my life. He was standing at that gate. He was eight or nine feet above a gate. And I looked off of that porch into his face and I knew him. I had been with him before. He was a minister and I'd seen him before, but I couldn't call his name to save my life. And I said to myself, my God, what a man. I've never seen a man that big. There ain't no such thing. Could that be God? And then uh, they run through my mind, you know, no, that couldn't be God because it says no man has seen God's face at any time and ever lived, and I ruled that out. And I said to myself, what am I going to say to a giant like that? And I kept thinking, you know, I said, sir, is there anything I can do for you? He says, get on the altar. And I thought to myself, my God, I've baptized thousands of people, married hundreds and hundreds of people, and never did charge them nothing. I preached hundreds of funerals, 400 that I know of, never did charge nothing, and now he's telling me to get on the altar. What's the matter with me that I have to get on the altar? And I said, sir, did you say get on the altar? And he looked at me again, and that's the only words he said, them two words. He said, get on the altar, the second time. And when I come out of that, then uh, he come down to a normal size, the same look, the uh, same person and everything, and he come down to normal size, and his head was only sticking over the gate, all right, like if you walked up to the gate, it was a normal size. And I looked at him again after that happened, and he just disappeared. And, and of course, I was troubled about having to get back on the altar. I thought, I thought I was really something. I was ready to go. I thought everything. And I couldn't understand it, why that a man had preached to 60 some years and retired and done all this for God and still needed to get on the altar. I couldn't understand it. And I was troubled, and I said, oh, God, what does this mean, getting on the altar? He says, well, if you want to be big for me in the world and my work, like that giant was, he says, you get on the altar and turn loose all that little bicycle and lawnmower stuff. He says, now, if you want to go on fixing bicycle and lawn more, you can be a little man for me, just a normal-sized guy. But he says, if you want to do something for me, I'll turn and reach on out, turn. He said, you let all that stuff go and become a full-time artist. And I felt sure that that vision that I seen, I seen it, brother, just like I'm looking at y'all right here now. And that man, so help me God, the next day, the next three days, I believe it was, there's a boy come along and says, Howard, we want you to preach my daddy's funeral. says, my daddy died. And I says, who is your daddy? He says, Mr. Hughes. He says, you know him? I said, yeah, I know all the Hugheses. I said, but listen, I can't, I can't tell you which Hughes he is till you bring me his picture. All right, he brought the picture by and showed it to me. And the minute I saw that picture, I told him, I said, man, your daddy stood at my back gate. Um, uh, uh, he stood a giant at my back gate the other day. I said, he, this very man is a man I seen. And he stood four days ago, he stood at my gate a giant. And I said, this is him, so help me God. And I knew I knew him, and I, and, and, and I was to preach his funeral. And four days before that, he appeared there as a giant, and then he come down to a normal size, and he was an old minister. And I said, that just fits in perfect, God, because, you see, he's deceased, and I've got to keep preaching. And I can't preach at churches because I'm getting too old to argue with deacons and try to going to meetings with churches and handle people like I have. I'm getting too old for that, God. 
I said, if there's anything else you want me to do, you just open the doors and I'll be there. I just wanted to work in the garden. I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to pastor churches. I wanted to work in this garden. That's all I did want to do. And I'd been working in it several years after I retired. And it kept bugging me. If you're able to work, you're able to preach. You're able to work, you're able to preach. And one day I got disgusted at it. And I just said, now, God, if there's anything else out there, you open the door for me. And I'll be there. Another son said, Word, I want to work in the garden. Well, I just started joking with him. I didn't think there wasn't more doors to open. So I just, I just ate it. I went on enjoying myself, thinking felt good, you know. Well, in a few days, uh, 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 it's uh, Andy. Andy called me and said, Howard said, we wondered if you'd come down to the University of Georgia, put on a slideshow, and be with us in the show. And it shocked me kind of, you know. I thought to myself, me, a sixth grade student, go to the University of Georgia and put on a show and talk down there. Not me. He's thinking of somebody else. And I said, you mean you want me to come down there and put on a slideshow, Andy? Yeah, in the art department. I said, well, yeah, I'll come because I'd done promise God. I said, if you open any doors, I'll be there. And I couldn't lie to God, you know, because I'd done lied to God before and you just can't get by. Keep on lying to God. And I, there's a door opened up, you see, all my life. I've heard of the University of Georgia, never had been there, and I've heard about it, and folks that I knew went there and finished school and everything, and I said, me, a sixth grade student, God, go to a university? Yeah, I heard you. All right, you see, I knew. All right, the next thing, you know, Andy had me appointment at the University of Miami, Florida, which I just, that's one of my choice places. I run a revival in Miami, Florida in 1950, and I, I love Miami, Florida. And he said, Howard says, how about going down to the University of Miami? I said, me? Yeah. Well, God opened the door 850 miles away for a fella that didn't even want to fly an airplane. <laughs> All right, I said to myself, I said, well, I told you if you open the doors, I'd be there, and I'm going to be a man of my word. I got on that TriStar and flew to Miami with Andy and put on a show down there. And Andy one day says, Howard says, my folks live in Colorado. I said, you know, Andy, I'd like to have a show in Colorado sometime if it's convenient. After I found out he could get a fuller show, I said, I'd like to have a show out there in Colorado. And I'm not sitting here if Andy and the Seas didn't get me an appointment at Denver, Colorado Springs, and from there they got me to come from San Francisco, and they had a whole truck made up me for me with three big universities, the State University of San Francisco, St. Joe's, and the, and, uh, the, and, uh, and the Davis University, and, uh, and the... Uh, Denver Springs, they had that all lined up for me on one big long trip. And Andy told me, he said, Howard, I'll go as far as Denver, will you? And I'll be in a show with you in Denver. So I uh, had a show in uh, Denver, Colorado, at Denver Springs University. And Andy was with me. We had a big time together. And we stayed at the director's house. She was a beautiful woman, had a nice husband. And you could stand down on her street and see Pike's Peak a mile high with snow on it out there. They took us to the kissing camels and everything. And, you know, when God began to open these doors, he also gave me a little vacation along with it, you know. People have <laughs> been nice to me. And that's what Andy, Andy and Assis has done. And him and Art, and Art has helped me a lot and, and discovered me to the world and, uh, and uh, just trying his best to get me in a banjo picker, knowing that I can't pass for a banjo picker, but he has tried hard to use me as a banjo picker, and he's really been a blessing to me, Art has. And he had me in one of his shows down in Atlanta, you know, and paid me for going down there. And I, I tell you, I, I, was, I said, now, I said, this guy over here, Guy Boost, I said, yeah, yeah, he's a man for you. And this guy over here, yeah, but Howard Fenster, no, I'm not a banjo picker. I'm not good enough, Art. He says, well, we got a tape of you, so we want you down there anyhow, because I, I knew he wanted one real good banjo picker and one fella that couldn't pick at all to let the people see the difference in me and Guy. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so when Guy got down there, when Guy got down there, Guy set the field on fire, you know. And I got up there, you know, I got up there and uh, pulled a cup of coffee out of my banjo player and oh. act like I was 100 years old, and I got up there. <laughs> And boy, I'm telling you what, too, when I'd come to a bad place, I'd raid in my voice like this. When a banjo was playing bad, I'd say, <laughs> And then when the banjo was going good like this, I'd say, <laughs> And I mixed them people up down there till they almost thought I was a uh, guy Bruce a sucker. Yeah. Yeah, and I made a lot of rackets, you know, when I had my ba bad banjo picking, and then when the banjo picking got to work, he had a good key, I lightened up on my voice and let them hear that. And I keep my head, kept my head all the time from my lousy playing and singing. And I mixed the bad and good ups together. They didn't know no difference. And, and old uh, Art paid me just as much as he paid any of them, you know, for getting up there and hiding all that stuff <laughs> and appearing as a banjo picker. <laughs> and then they just kept opening up. From that, it opened up in two big universities in North Carolina, 
one big college of art in Philadelphia, and then the Smithsonian, the top university of the state. They seated me with the students coming in from all over. I ate dinner with students, showed them pictures of the garden, and, and uh, they got me in uh, three or four interviews. Even had me to play that song on live radio up there, and people heard me, you know, and they come down and say, Howard, we heard you singing over radio in Washington, and all that stuff. And uh, I've really had fun, and God's opened a lot of doors. And now, it's talking about this church here, uh, Billy Wright is a pastor of this church. He's a assembly of God, and he's been pastoring here a long time. And since I retired, I wouldn't really have to go to church. I could slip over here behind this fence at my garden and listen to his whole service. Hear him shout and on, hear him preach and everything. So I didn't have to go nowhere to go to church. I would just come here in my old paint clothes and I would go down behind that fence and listen to them however services are. You know. And I got to where I enjoyed hearing singing and services going on close to the garden here. And, and I thought to myself, and uh, this little girl lives right there, she's out there one day, I said, I heard Billy Wright's going to sell that church. I said, yeah, she's wanting $30,000 for it. I said, Lord of mercy, $30,000, i never seen $5,000. I couldn't buy that. And that's what I've always said about myself. I can't do it. When God called me to paint, I said, I can't do it. When he told me to go to these universities and things, I said to myself, that's, that's too high, I can't do it. Everything he's ever called him, and I said, I can't do it. And I found this one thing out. The thing you can't do is exactly what you, you ought to try. That's what you ought to try. When you got something under your hand and under your heart and under your fingers and you know you can do it, that ain't no challenge at all. It's something you just say, I can't do it. You just try. And everything I ever said that I thought I couldn't do, I didn't believe I could do it. And out of my unbelief, I gained perfect faith because the things that I believed in my heart I couldn't do, I come out doing them. And out of unbelief came perfect faith. And it's like that Samson said over there, you know, one time he come by and he killed us a lion. A few years later he come by and the bees had built in his carcass and had honey. And old Samson had a riddle for him and he said, boy, they can't undo this. And he said, out of the eater came forth meat. See, out of the eater came forth meat and they couldn't unravel that riddle. Well, I got one for y'all. It's high as a house, and it's low as a mouse, and it's bitter as gall, but it's good after all. Now, if you can tell me what that is, I'd like you to tell me. And anyhow, I said to myself, I, I talked about this church, and I said, now, I need that for a gallery. Art could have his uh, festivals there. He could have his singing and everything there, and it wouldn't cost him nothing. And be in the garden, I could entertain students. I could marry people there, which have done had weddings in there already. And I said, be nice, so I'd like to have that, but I can't. All right, this preacher come to me, and he'd, he'd held it a pretty good while, and I called him. I said, just might as well turn it loose. I don't think I can get it. He said, I wouldn't sell it for, for $30,000 if I get it right now. I said, I believe God wants you to have that preacher. and says, I'm holding it for you $20,000. He'd give me $10,000 off on the church. And I still said to myself, I can't do it. I tried uh, loan companies in Denver. I tried loan companies all around here to try to buy money, just to buy that on the credit. And me, just a poor man, thinking, knowing I might never pay it out. <clears throat> and they wouldn't talk about loaning me nothing. And there I was again. I just said to myself, I can't do it. And uh, then I thought to myself something. said, how, why can't you do it? I said, well, I just can't. And I said, how you know? Well, I said, there's only one thing I know. I'll start a faith fund down at the bank on it. And that's all I'm going to do. And I started a faith fund, and people come here and got to buy my painting. And just in two or three months, I had $8,000. I'd sold the paintings, pay down on this church. And I told that preacher, I said, I've got $8,000 that I'd like to pay down on that church. And I says, he says, I tell you what, says, uh, we owe 5000 on that church, and we're still paying on it. And he says, if you'll, if you'll pay me that 8000 down and sign a side note for the other 7000 some, he says, you can get that church. So I went ahead and paid the 8000 down and just kept putting money in the faith fund, and that other 7500 come in, and I had that $15,000 money like I've never even seen in my life before. That whole $15,000 had come in and I paid the note off on the TV down here in Sonoma, handing him a check saying, and I told him where the money come from and everything to pay it off with, and my own county had not have a dollar in it. There's people from Washington and San Francisco and Nashville, Tennessee and all just paid the thing. You might say just a couple of minutes paid out. Now, now then I just owe the 5000 something. And I got the low terms on it and got the payments down working and handling. It's like a dream. I can't believe it. It's like a dream. It couldn't happen to me. I still look around and say it just couldn't happen to me, but it has. But y'all see it has. And now all I owe was just the bank, see, and I'm, and I'm paying off. When I was in the hospital, uh, Victor Forsanto gave me that Cadillac. He had a bunch of my little paintings, and he had sold $700 worth of them and sent me my half of it. 
He made uh, half of seven hundred dollars for himself and half for me. And my wife brought the check and said, "Lord, that sure did come in good on a three thousand dollar hospital bill." Mm -hmm. And then this guy from Louisiana had come and bought six hundred dollars worth. And then he, while the other day before I was really able to pack, pack them, I took a uh, Polaroid pictures, you know, of my paintings. And he wanted to know if I had anything else available. He liked them and he'd got. And there's people interested in them out there in New Orleans. So he said, "Howard, I want." Uh, you just send me pictures of what you got available. So I sent him pictures of eight little paintings that I had ready to go. This $150 size, which I sold at the gallery uh, for $100 a piece, which Victor gets them from 75 And uh, I told him, I said, I have eight paintings here. I said, if you want them all, you can have them for $850. One of them's a little bigger than the other. And he looked at the pictures and everything, and he called me and said, Howard says, ship them all. He says, I'll put a check in the mail for $850. So you see, I'm paying on the 5000 now, and it looked like it. I have the greatest prospect in the world paying that out. And now then I've got the church, and all I've got is just a little hard work and just turning things over to God and trusting Him that He's able to get the money up. The bank wouldn't let me have it. And now the other church says, and i got a deed to it, and all again, it's just this five thousand, four or five thousand dollars to get in the church, and I've got monthly terms on that. And uh, so there the church is. I don't need that church. I've been operating on. I ain't, uh, I ain't too physically well in my body. I feel good as I did when I was 16 years old, but I do I do know that I'm going on 67 years old. And outside of that, I feel good as a young man, and I'm strong as a young man, and I feel good, and I, I'm able to go a long ways yet. And I'm not as nigh wore out as I thought it was. And there the church is. I don't need it. I could take it and make an apartment house of it and rent it out and get $150 a month for it. I could take it and and, and uh, rent it to anybody for just a cleanup house for cars or anything and get $100 a month out of it, but I don't want no money out of it. I got it because a man told me, says, I feel like God wants you to have it, and I felt like the students needed it, and I'd seen people sit around on these rocks, students that come here sit around on these rocks till there's bound to have corn starting on And I think to myself, if I had that chapel, I could go in there and sit. And I said, another thing, I said to teachers, I said, if you had four or five students, and wanted to bring sleeping bags. She'd sleep in there on the floor in the summertime and stay two or three days here at the garden and fix a little workshop in the basement. She could just come here with her class and just take over and live in Paradise Garden two or three days or a week and teach her students go right on with her work. And there had all this, she could have it. And I thought to myself, and that'd be wonderful to know that there's a teacher over there with her students and is having a good time and it was going on with their work and their classes and everything. And on a vacation all at the same time, they could go down and eat fruit all the garden, go down in the night in the moonlight, see the shadows of everything, you know. And there's times of the night that's beautiful down in there. There's times of the night it's so, so much different than it is in the daytime. And I'm down in there all parts of the night and the daytime and everything else because I work of the night. I'm more like a hoot owl or something. I don't sleep much in the daytime. I work about 4 o'clock of the morning. And then I go to bed about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I sleep till 9 or 10 o'clock. I get about 7 hours. And I get up in the whole afternoon, beautiful sunshine, work out in the garden and the flowers. I go in and drink me a cup of coffee and sit around a while, and maybe look at a TV program or something, and start painting and paint all night till 4 o'clock the next morning. Ain't nobody there, everything's quiet, and all you can hear are just the whispers of God. He tells me the names to put on my painting, titles. And all through the night, visions come rolling over my eyes like a television screen. And I can't even make notes of all of them. I'll grab a pencil and I put on here a dark shadow art. I'll grab a pencil and I see this ink, I'll say ink art. And all that stuff, and I got coffee cans full of them cards of things that I'd love to draw and just make one painting of them. I'll never lift this because they're getting into hundreds and into thousands of mottos and names and poems. And I write lots of poetry. And I'm a stranger in this world. Every time I meet a person, I see he is an earth person. He's a great guy. <coughs> and all the people in this world, there's such a small particle difference in them to just enough to make them a different person. If it wasn't like that, they'd all be the same thing. And they all come from just one mighty creation. And the thing about people is they are their own destruction. They are their own pollution. Every fowl and every bird, every animal stays in the instinct that God made him. He's just like he was in the Garden of Eden. Every dog, a little hen will fight for her little ones. She'll, she'll get between them in a windstorm and offer herself to save her little ones. People are not like that. They get shut of the little babies, throw them over in the sea, waste can and everything else. I'm not comparing everybody at this point. I'm telling you that we, as human beings, have blessed our natural instinct, and we're growing into the difficulties of our own difficulties as caused in the kind of people. And all we know to do is to pray with them, work with them, and live with them, and love all of them. 
at every nation under the countenance of heaven today. Russia ought to be saying to the United States, the United States, you all hope us. When we're freezing to death and whooped and beat all to pieces, you all hope us. Now then, if there's anything we can do for you, United States, we're standing ready, full armed, to help you, United States. And that little country over there in Argentina, a rich little country that our cheese country and dairy product country and everything has surprised me and just made me feel so bad to think it'd rise up for a little bunch of rocks out in the ocean and threaten war with it. And right here on the, on the verge of running out of oil and food and everything and short summer's coming and food getting scarcer and I'm talking about desperate famines in this world and then the, 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 the whole world rise up with deadly bombs and everything and said we're going to fight over what little's left. There's two biscuits in the pan, and Russia says, I'm going to get it. Argentina says, I'm going to get it. And America's sitting there trying to get them to make peace on it and divide it equally, and it just won't do it. I'm a stranger here, and I imagine a lot of you are. It's too bad. And i tell you one thing. Uh, I would to God. In my paintings and everything, I try to tell all the nations that they ought to get together and love one another and appreciate one another and see that every country has its part of the all everywhere. Every country has its share of the food everywhere and that they will live like brothers and sisters, nations and nations. And I notice the churches are coming together like Catholic and Protestant and Methodist and all, they're coming together more. But it's a, it's a, it's a nations we need to get together. We need to get the nations together and. Uh, and that's what I'm doing, a lot of my paintings, some of my paintings is wild, and I guess that's one reason I get shot at once in a while like a jackrabbit, because they don't like my sermons and messages on my painting, because it's, it's a sight with some sermons I put out. I just sent a sermon to New York with a house divided and it's cut out in white and put on this dark shot of black ground, and that thing was covered from devils, from little bitty devils to big old devils all over that house. And around it in that black shadow was angel just flying away from that house. They were all leaving the house, and these little devils was all in the house, and two or three people peeping out the window, and I'd talk to them on there. I said, why did you hoard up these devils and run the angels off? When you go to die, you don't need devils. They can't carry you to help. You're going to need some angels, friends. Why did you run the angels off and house up the devils? And that's the awfulest message you ever heard. Now, that's cutting, and it's really boring. And, to some people, and it's just it's so plain, just two things, the devil's in the house and the angels is leaving, and why did you want the devil instead of the angels? Because the older you get, you get ready to die. The devil can't deliver you, but you need the angel instead of the devil. And I, that message has gone out, and for messages like that, some people shoot it. They don't like it. Yeah. But I say, what is a devil? Is it a big monster? No, the devil don't bomb houses and burn forests. The devil's a spirit that gets in the people and makes them do it. You never find the devil bombing nothing. He gets in the people and they do it. He uses us as instruments. It's pretty new. He don't do anything. He stays hit all the time. He's in the clear. You can get him up in court and he'll come out clear. You see, he gets in the people and hides them. And they think the people does it. And they kill the people and hang them and put them in an electric chair, fur it, and it's a devil all the time. Doesn't it? It's not really the people. They just, they got so obsessed with the devil. They just turned up with those one and one. It's a spirit, the devil, the spirit. Some of them little devils, like when me and my wife gets in a tear down and I see she's boiling real hot, you know, I'll cool down quick because I know if I get hot as she is, it's going to be a war. And then you see, if she gets wild and gets like that, I cool down and then when I get wild and mad and everything and fly off the handle, she sees it's going to be serious enough, she'll quieten down. So we just give and take and give and take, there ain't nothing left, much of either one of them. And that's the reason I like students like this and teachers to come here with their classes and everything. And that's the meaning of the whole garden. It's for people like y'all that wants to feel free and get off of the roads a few minutes of the fence around you and locks on the gate where you can enjoy yourself. That's what the garden's about. I didn't even need the garden, but I love a garden. I've always loved the garden. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Brother Archie. Go ahead. I've well, used up a lot of your valuable time for you. Oh, well, let's do one together. Let's do a song. So I'll try uh, did you try it. doing that? Well, God can do that for you with me over. Which and what is it?
should quit uh, now. Maybe um, some of the people probably like to look around the garden a little more. And, yeah. Well, I can walk and around and they like now. to see. They might like to yeah. see the. Um, be around with you if you want to ask any questions about anything. That Art don't know. Art's been here so much. Him and uh, him and uh, Andy, it'll, uh, they know about as much about the garden as I do. Andy's been com he come here two years making slides before he'd ever tell me who he was from or who he was. Andy did. It took him two years before he'd ever help me in his class. He's a he's a super <coughs> expert examiner. He won't have you unless he sees you're going to be all right. For him. <laughs> That's, that's my bag. <laughs> you can maybe uh, put these in the church and get ready to go. Or maybe, uh, what do you, I guess if we leave about, what well, maybe, if we leave about quarter after three.